Welcome to Manchester Christian Church tonight where we pray for one. If you're visiting with us online, welcome. We're excited to get started and experience the presence of the Lord here tonight as we worship Him. But first, when you walked in, you received a program that has a connect card on there. We'd love for you to fill that out. We want to pray with you for the things that you're praying for, okay? We'd love for you to pass those in later on in the service. But for now, would you stand with me? Turn to someone next to you, say hello, make them feel welcome tonight. joy to come to you and bring our worship and adoration. Let our praise be your welcome tonight. We lift you high, high, God in God alone. Your name be loud, loud than any other song you are forever seated.
scripture says that salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to us by which we must be saved. Jesus, we turn to you, our salvation, our hope, our joy, our crown. We love you, Lord. people, Lord. Lord, help us by your spirit to become, become people who are about your kingdom. The fullness of eternal promise, stirring in your sons and daughters, earth revealing Heaven's wonder, Spirit, come, Spirit, come. What you spoke is now unfolding, and all your children shall behold it. And dreams awaken in this moment. Spirit, come, Spirit, come, pour it out, let your love run over, here and now, let your glory fill this house, pour it out, let your love run over. your presence 
for our King is soon returning. And as we hold to this assurance, Spirit, come. struck by your presence, by the way of your glory. Lord, would you change us by the power of your spirit that we would be ready to do your will, God. We pray. Amen. You can have a seat, church. Oh, man, you guys know what's fun. I mean, just like what is so much fun and, and life-giving? Jury duty. <laughs> I mean, everybody loves jury duty. There's nothing like going to your mailbox and, and seeing that envelope, and you're like, is it? Is it? Could it be? And you, you tear it open. Yes, it's a summons. I get to go be a part of a jury. Yay. It turns out it's really not that much fun. It sounds great, but it's not all that great. And so it, people are always trying to figure out ways to get out of jury duty. Now, it's an important part of our civic responsibility. I understand that. But hey, guys, listen, I'm here to help. And I'm pretty good at getting out of things. So I got a few pointers for you. You want to get out of jury duty, here's what you do. If you don't, if you don't get, you know, weeded out in the initial, you know, like application questionnaire phase and you have to go in like for the interview part, here's what you do. You just walk in and you say, hey, before we begin, I do have a few questions of my own. You take charge of this scenario and start this thing off with a few questions of your own. I like to start off with something like this. Hey, guys, um, I just need to know what is the maximum number of bathroom breaks allowed in the course of a day? Because, I mean, I have to plan what I'm going to eat for breakfast. That's a good start. Or then if that doesn't work, I move on to this. I'm like, hey, what's your policy on wiener dogs? I mean, like, will she have to stay inside my sweatshirt or can she sit next to me on the bench? I see you know, because Longfellow has to be prepared. <laughs> when the judge says recess, will you be providing a kickball or do we have to bring our own? <laughs> need to know ahead of time. I need to know, will I be working with Wapner or Judy? <laughs> Important thing to know. Is there a specific time for snacks and are peanut allergies a problem? Need to know that ahead of time. Um, is napping frowned upon? An important one. And one more, um, do you provide souvenir robes and gavels? <laughs> I just want a little something to remember this by. 
Just go in and, and ask some, some questions of your own and you can get right out of it. Now, I was thinking about that. It's kind of weird how people do hate jury duty and how they, they want to get out of it so desperately. And I was kind of wrestling with that. I was like, what is it about jury duty? I don't think it's just the time involved in it. I think that there is something about us where we don't want to get our hands dirty. Now, what's, what's weird about that is, as a whole, I think most people kind of like the feeling of being judges. Like, we kind of love that, that nasty attitude of judging other people, because I'm assuming we love it because we do it an awful lot, don't you think? We look at other people and we make judgments. Sometimes they're snap judgments. Sometimes they're, they're judgments based on just face value. Sometimes they're judgments that we carry with us from our past. But we look at people and we make judgments and we're quick to judge. And then if, if the judgment is one that is indicting of another person, and we hear about this, a lot of times we, we love to jump on the bandwagon. I, I think it's kind of a bloodthirsty mentality. Like you smell blood in the water, we're like sharks. Here we come. We come from all over and, and we swirl around and, and we want to get close to that carnage, but not too close. See, I think that's why we don't want to be a part of a jury. Because when you're on the jury, you're now responsible. But I think if, if we believe we're disconnected from the process, we're safe. We're okay. But I got to tell you guys, Jesus looks at it differently. He, he notices our, our hearts and our attitudes and the things we say in private. Also, the things we say in public. I mean, this whole social media phenomenon is, is bringing light to, I think, the darkness of our hearts in increasing measure. The comments and the things people say and the, the phrases they use and the attacks they levy and, and how they go after people. It reveals a, a bloodthirsty nature inside of us. But again, it's that distance that's there. We think, well, it's okay because, you know what, I, I'm not face to face with this person. Or sometimes we justify it and we say, well, it's okay because that person's a public figure. I mean, so they're fair game. Yeah, but every one of those public figures is a person. Somebody's child, somebody's spouse, somebody's parent, a real person. And when we do these things, it reveals more about our hearts than it really does about the hearts of another. Now, here's what I want you to know. Jesus is for you. He's for you. He's not against you. He's, he's for you. So even as we kind of wrestle with this kind of bloodthirsty mentality and, and deal with the reality of our own stuff, our, our own mess, how we like to kind of judge from a distance and carry this bloodthirsty mentality, I want you to know Jesus is for you. In fact, could you say that out loud with me? Can you say Jesus is for me? Let's try it together. Jesus is for me. Yes. Don't forget it. Don't forget it. He is for you. Now, we're in this message series called Stones. That's what it's called. I reminded you of that, guys, when we started the series last week. It's a series that's leading us right up to Easter. Easter's on April 1st. We're going to have our service at the arena. It's going to be amazing, and, and people are going to meet Jesus, and we're going to worship our living Savior. But we're preparing for that by realizing that Jesus is taking us and making us into living stones to be his people, his temple, his church, his family. And our memory verse for this series is found in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. We're going to put that up on the screens, and I want you to read this out loud with me. If you're worshiping with us online, wherever you are right now, let's read this out loud together. It says, You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And so we are reminded that we are like living stones, that, that Jesus is taking us, he's choosing us, he's a master builder. And he's taking us and he's putting us together to make his church, his family, where he is being revealed through us. And we're a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus. It's through this relationship with Jesus where he takes us and he shapes us and puts us together. And what was, you know, one thing on its own becomes something totally new as a part of the family of God. And what a joy it is we get to share in this. Now, when we think about Jesus and we realize, okay, wait a minute, we're not our own anymore. Jesus is taking us and, and turning us into to living stones as a part of his family and a part of his house. Then we need to remember that we don't just represent ourselves, but we represent Jesus and his church and the whole family of God. We represent the kingdom. And everything we say and everything we do, everything we, we skip out on or fail to do, we're always representing Jesus. And if we're representing Jesus, then it's important to understand how he thinks and feels. 
And one of the things I can tell you for sure is that Jesus does not share our bloodthirsty desires. Jesus absolutely, positively does not share our bloodthirsty desires. These desires that, that we have within us to see other people fail, to see other people get caught, to see other people punished. Jesus doesn't share in these desires. There's an amazing passage of scripture in John chapter eight. You, you may be familiar with it. It's a, oftentimes referred to as the, the woman who was caught in adultery. There, were, there was a crowd, a mob who wanted to stone her. But Jesus is gonna stand up for this woman. But today when we look into this text, I, I want you to see something even beyond just Jesus and the woman. I want you to, to understand how Jesus feels about this crowd who is thirsty for blood. This crowd who is, is using a, a woman who was caught in the act of adultery as a, as a way of trapping Jesus, of catching him and, and accusing him. And look how Jesus responds to them. We pick up the story in John chapter 8, verse 2. It says, at dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts, Jesus. He appears again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group, and they said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote in the ground. Now, this story is one that is shared often. And there's quite a bit going on here, but it's interesting to see the, the heart of people here. And when I see the heart of people, I mean my heart and your heart, our hearts, the, the heart of people, people like you and me. This, this crowd is looking for a show. They're looking for a scene. They're, they're trying to figure out a way to, to accuse Jesus of something. And so they pick for their bait a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. And their bloodthirstiness is kind of revealed through this as this crowd shows up. Here's Jesus who's standing in the temple courts. He's sat down and he's instructing the people. He's doing a great thing. He's, he's telling them, doing what he came to do. Jesus came to, to preach the good news that God is for the poor and God is for the oppressed and God is for those who are far from him. That there is a way for everyone to become like living stones and be a part of his kingdom. He's sharing this amazing news, and you get this mob who comes barging in, using a woman who's been caught in the act of adultery as bait. I, I, I kind of want you to, to wrestle with that and get your brain around this scene. What's going on here? This is messed up. This is broken. This is awful. Jesus is sharing this incredible news, and the crowd comes in, and they want to ruin it. And they're accusing this woman. They say, we have a question for you. There was this woman who was caught in the act of adultery. They made her stand in, in front of everyone who was there. And they asked Jesus, what do you say we do with her? The law of Moses says that we must stone such women. To stone them would mean to pick up rocks and, and throw them at her until she was dead. It was a death penalty. And what they're doing right here in this moment is, is they're essentially having a trial. Jesus, you're going to be the judge today, and we'll be the witnesses. We are accusing this woman. We caught her red-handed in the act of adultery, so we're going to have her stand up in front of you and all these people who are listening to you. And now we have a question for you. What do, you, what do we do? The law says we must stone her. So what do we do? Now, what's, what's great about Jesus is he, he is the judge, and what do judges do? They deliberate. So he bends down while they're making their accusations and asking their questions, and, and he writes in the dirt. And I, just, I love that. My man Jesus is just an angry mob, woman caught in adultery. He's like, oh, man. You know, he's probably preaching like the sermon of his life at that moment, too. 
And these jokers come in and interrupt. He's like, fine. All right. And I don't know if he was talking to his dad. Dad, what do you want to do here? Dad, how do, you, how do you want me to handle this one? And they just kept questioning him. I mean, they're getting louder and they're getting angry and they're like, come on, Jesus, come on, what are we going to do? People are looking, you know, for the best rock to throw. Crowd's getting bigger. Now there's a scene, there's a ruckus. And you know when there's a ruckus, here we come. I mean, come on, you New Hampshireites love a good ruckus. Yeah, people are coming for the ruckus. And Jesus, he stands up. And they kept questioning him. And he just, he stands up and he looks at them and he goes, all right. Here's my decision. If any of you is without sin, throw the first stone. And he bends down. And he starts to draw him in the ground again. Now, what's great here is Jesus isn't actually avoiding the question. He's answering them. He says, okay, you want me to judge? I'll judge right now. If any of you is without sin, you can throw the first stone. Now, we'll get to what he means by that. But, but first, let's deal with this bloodthirsty mentality. Let's examine ourselves. Let's do a little diagnostic work on our hearts right now. Let's take a little look there. Are we, are we bloodthirsty as a people? Here's a few questions to kind of wrestle with. The first one would be, do I try to catch people in sin? Like, is this something that, that brings me pleasure? Like, am I, am I looking for an opportunity where somebody's messing up, where I can call them out on it, or I can point it out to somebody else? Am I comparing myself to other people? It's kind of like when we have our, our services at the arena. You know, we have security there. We have a lot of security. You get there early so you can get through security to go through the metal detectors. And we have a police force that's present because we know the world that we live in. And one of the first times we had service at the arena, they came to me and they said, Bo, we don't want you to worry. Um, we're going to have a plainclothes officer who will have your back and, and we'll have him back a little bit so he's not in the way. I said, what are you talking about? I go, I don't want to catch anybody. We're going for prevention here. I want an officer in full uniform standing right next to me. Nobody needs to tell me anything a police officer can't hear. I don't, I, don't want, I don't want to be bait. Nobody wants to be bait. And, and when you start, you, you kind of process through that and you go, well, wait a minute, yeah, what is this kind of wicked thing inside of us that just loves to see other people blow it? And the more epically they blow it, the more we love to talk about it. The more we love to read about it, the more we love to watch it. There's a, a bloodthirsty desire in us where we just want to catch people in sin and compare ourselves to them. All right, so that's the first question. The second question is, do you want to see people pay for their sins? Like, do you have a mentality that says, you know what, they should get what they deserve? You ever find yourself saying those words? That person should get what he deserves. She should get what she deserves. Everybody should get what they deserve except you. You ever notice that? It's like, I'm the only one who's actually eligible for grace. Grace, unmerited favor, a free gift from God. You don't deserve it. You don't earn it. It's, it's by grace through faith we've been saved, not by works, but the gift of God so that no one can boast. I mean, everybody else should get what they deserve, but, but I, I should get grace. What is up with that? What, what, a, what a strange thing to think and, and feel. And when we have this desire to see other people pay for their sins, I, I would have to imagine that, that we really don't understand grace at all. If grace isn't for everyone, then it's really for no one. And so if in your mind, you know, grace is only for a few, you know, me and mine and those who are like me, but it's not for anyone else, then I don't think you've really tasted grace. I don't think you've really understood it and received it. Because when, when grace gets in us, it, it changes us. And we don't want people to get what they deserve. We want people to accept the very thing they don't deserve. You know, as we pray for one, I think that's one of the, the hardest parts about praying for one. It's really coming to grips with we're saying to God, yep, yeah, 
God, you know that one I really don't want? But you really do. God, love that person through me. But when you start to do that, that's when you really become one of these living stones, a part of God's family. And the third question is, do you actually want to participate in punishing people? Is this something that like appeals to you? Now, it's kind of wild in the, the cultural context we live in now with social media where we, we have access to public shaming again. You can share, you can retweet, you can like, you can comment, and you can jump right in there, and you can be an active participant in the punishment and accusation of people. And you can do it all from anywhere you want to be. And it feels like you don't have to get your hands dirty. And so put yourself in this crowd. I'm not sure who you'll resonate with. Maybe you're just one of the people who were there, you know, listening to Jesus. And you were like, wow, this is good news. Maybe you really resonate with the woman brought out and thrown in front of this crowd, being publicly accused, her life hanging in the balance. Maybe you resonate with the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. They want justice to be served. Our law says this, what do you say? We just want to get it right. Maybe you resonate with people who are just coming to see what the ruckus was all about. No matter who you are, and no matter what you've done, and no matter what's been done to you, no matter which, which part of this you resonate with the most, I want you to know Jesus is for you. And what he does in this story reveals that. You see, Jesus was asked a legal question. And Jesus gave a legal answer to a legal question. They asked him this legal question. Our law says this woman must be stoned, that she must be put to death. What do you say? And Jesus answers. He says, okay, whoever's without sin, you throw the first stone. He's giving a, a legal answer to a legal question. Now, Jesus understood the law. They were testing him and, and quizzing him, and, and they were really looking for a basis of accusation against him, not only this woman, but also Jesus as well. And so he refers back to the law. He goes, oh, you, okay, you guys want to talk about law? Well, okay, here we go. Let's, let's talk about law. He drew on the ground for a little bit, collected his thoughts, stood up and said, okay, I'm going to say one thing to you, and you guys are going to connect the dots. Whoever of you is without sin, you throw the first stone. He's saying, all right, you guys are going to connect the dots. You're, you're going to get this. Now, Jesus knew the law. They knew the law. They were Pharisees, teachers in the law, experts in the law. They knew it. And so what Jesus said to them made their minds start to connect the dots. In the Old Testament, we go to Deuteronomy. This is the Old Testament law they were referring to. Deuteronomy 22, verse 22. It says, if a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. You must purge the evil from Israel. So this was the law they were referring to. Moses, in the law of Moses, he said that this woman should be put to death or must be put to death. What do you say? So Jesus is like, all right, all right, here's the law, here's the command. But there is a problem. And maybe you guys have already figured out the problem. Well, we'll look at it again. If, if a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man and the woman are to be put to death. Okay, so what's wrong with this scene? It takes two to tango, and we only got one. Just, just the woman's there. So where's, where's the man? If they were caught in the act of adultery, where's the fella? Where's, where's the fella? Now, there's a problem because the, the woman's here, but the, the fella's not. So Jesus is already like, okay, this whole proceeding is off. You want a trial? You want a legal proceeding? Well, we're, we're already off. There's only one here. Then in, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 6, and this is what it says about the proceedings and how an accusation is to be made. It says, on the testimony of two or three witnesses, a person is to be put to death, but no one is to be put to death on the testimony of only one witness. 
The hands of the witnesses must be the first in putting that person to death, and then the hands of all the people, you must purge the evil from among you. So when the law says, okay, you want to make an accusation, all right, you can't do it on the basis of one accuser. You're going to need at least two or three. And the people who make the accusation, they're the ones who have to throw the first stones. So if we're going to do this, all right, we're already off because the man's not here, no fella. And now whoever's going to stand up and make the accusation, you are going to have to throw the first stones. You're going to have to get your hands dirty. So who's going to make the accusation? That's why Jesus says, whichever one of you is without sin, you throw the first stone. You're responsible. You want to make the accusation. You want to accuse her. You want to bear witness to it. You are responsible. You will throw the first stone. Okay. But there's more to the law. Deuteronomy 19 verse 16 says this. If a malicious witness takes the stand to accuse someone of a crime... The two people involved in the dispute must stand in the presence of the Lord before the priests and the judges who are in office at that time. The judges must make a thorough investigation. And if the witness proves to be a liar, giving false testimony against a fellow Israelite, then do to the false witness what the witness intended to do to the other party. You must purge the evil from among you. In other words, you guys want to throw a stone... You want to make the accusation, you're going to have to throw the stone. But if you throw the stone, you're falsely accusing this woman because you don't have the fella here. So Jesus is, is, yes, he's standing up for the woman, which is great. But he's also standing up for the accusers. Don't miss it. He's also standing up for the accusers. And he's saying, you don't want to do this. You are in violation of the law. You are malicious witnesses. You are using this woman as a trap to get to me. And if you throw those stones, then you are guilty of sin and are to be put to death by the same law. You don't want to do this. Now, I wonder if things would look a little different for us if we experience something like that? What if every time you falsely accuse someone of something, you suffered the consequences? You might shut your mouth a little more often. <laughs> you might keep your opinions to yourself a little more often, right? We, we, might, we might back off a little bit and, and control our tongues a little more often. I mean, if you accuse someone of adultery and you don't know, you weren't there, you're, you're not a part of it, you're not a party to it, you, you're just jumping in and making the accusation and it's not true, then what if you face the consequence of maybe having your spouse or your relationship end? What if you accuse somebody of, of lying or, or cheating or stealing? And you're just going along with the crowd and you're just a part of it, but it wasn't real and it didn't really happen. And so you suffered the consequences of having your reputation completely ruined and destroyed. What if you accuse someone of a crime? I don't mean going to the police, I mean just, oh, it's a criminal. That person's a criminal. And you served the jail time or had to pay the fines. we'd probably back off in a hurry. And so what Jesus does is he's going to give testimony here. They have these witnesses, these accusers, and it's a legal proceeding. But what Jesus does is Jesus testifies for us instead of against us. He's testifying for us instead of against us. Now, that's what's so amazing about him is, is he's saying, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand up not only for this woman, but I'm also standing up for you. We pick it up there in verse 9 of John 8. It says, at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left and the woman was still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said then neither do I condemn you, declare Jesus. Go now and leave your life of sin. Oh, man. 
I love those words Jesus says. Then neither do I condemn you, declare Jesus. He's declaring it as the judge. He said, I, I don't condemn you either. Where are your accusers? Well, they went away. The, the older ones first, because the older ones are, we're, we're probably doing the math a little faster. Going back through the law, okay, who's without sin? Oh, man, he's got us. We tried to trap him, and he's got us. And they walked away. And, and I, I don't know how big the crowd was, but it was probably pretty significant. And, and we don't know how long it took for everyone to leave. But now it's just Jesus and this woman. Jesus has actually saved the crowd from themselves being condemned. He's, he's helped them. And now he looks at this woman. Where are your accusers? Mm. What, what's so fantastic about this is most of the people who are accused most often are alone. But Jesus stands up for you. And I don't want you to ever forget that. That person that everybody has turned against, that person that everybody's abandoned, that person that everybody's written off, everybody's given up on, the one who's had all the fingers pointed at, Jesus doesn't leave. And he doesn't give up. And he doesn't condemn. And he says these incredible words. He says, go now and leave your life of sin. In other words, hey, you're free. And, and me, he's saying, you're, you're changed, you're transformed, you're a new creation. The old is gone, the, the new has come. You, you don't have to, to go back to whatever, but it, you're free. And Jesus makes this choice not to condemn us, but rather to receive us and transform us and, and change us. And I, I would ask you, where is our hope if we ignore so great a salvation? Like if you go, you know what, forget that. You know, I, I'm okay on my own. I'm not like that woman, or I'm not like that guy, or I'm not like those people, or I'm not like, you know, the ones who do that. I'm, I'm not like that. And we ignore so great a salvation. I mean, it's kind of like this, like, if you were out in a boat and, you know, the one boat was 10 miles offshore and it started to sink, those people would need to be saved, wouldn't they? A boat that was 20 miles offshore and it started to sink, those people would need to be saved, wouldn't they? If it was 30 miles offshore and it started to sink, those people would need to be saved. Now, maybe you're a really good swimmer, but you're not going to make it. You could be the best swimmer in the whole world. I'm the best swimmer who ever lived. You're not going to make it. You need to be saved just like the worst swimmer in the bunch who's the furthest away. And we deceive ourselves into thinking, you know what? I'm different. I'm better. I don't, I don't need Jesus like that. How could we ignore so great a salvation? You see, what Jesus ultimately does here is Jesus brings light to the law. There, there was this law, and they were using the law in this scenario, in this story. They were, they were using the law for darkness. They were using it to accuse a woman, to try to trap Jesus. And, and that's what oftentimes happens with, with law is it becomes a tool to oppress and hurt people. But that is not what God desires. And Jesus brought light to the law. The very next thing he says in John 8, verse 12, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. 
Jesus declares to them, you you don't have to walk in darkness anymore because I am bringing light to the law. The law is there, and and yes, it it reveals who God is and who we are in relationship to him. It, It reveals what he desires and what he wants, and his commands are good. They're for us, not against us. They're not meant to oppress or to harm, but rather to bring us together. But when the law is abused, it is used to hurt people. And we see this today. We see it even within the church today. I see a lot of churches that get really focused on talking about issues. We have to talk about the issues. Where do we stand on all these issues? We've got to make a stand on every issue. Whatever the hot button issue of the day is. You name it. Sex, guns, politics. You've got to take a stand. And we get so busy taking stands, nobody's ever taking ground. This is what we're against. This is what we're against. This is what we're against. What are we for? We're for people. We're for Jesus. We're for his kingdom. We're for his mission. We have so many incredible life-giving things to be for. But we get distracted talking about issues. Guys, they're, they're not issues. They're people. Every one of those issues is is about people, real people with with real names and real stories that Jesus died for and and adores. And he's for them. And if Jesus is for them, then I want to be for them. And I want you to be for them. His church, these living stones, we're to be for them. So I'm not interested in talking about issues. I'll talk about people, though. I'll talk about people I know, people I've met. And here's what I would say to you. If you want to talk about issues instead of people, it's usually because you don't know any people. I find that most of the people who are the nastiest on issues don't actually know any people. They don't know the names. They don't know the stories. They're at a distance. Don't really want to be on the jury want to keep their hands clean. But when you know people, it changes things. So my encouragement to you is stop talking about issues. Talk about people. If you don't know any people, go out and meet some. And if you don't want to do that, then maybe you just shut it. (laughs) That'd be a whole lot better. Because you know what? I'm people, and you're people. And whether you're like the woman or one of the accusers or somebody just running to see the ruckus, Jesus stands up for every one of us. And so we get to stand up for everyone else too. And so I, I want to give you a challenge. Um, I want to challenge you to pray for one. But I want you to pray for a, a tough one. Praying for one is simple. God, please give me one person to share your love with. But pray for a tough one. Someone who's hard to love. Someone that's a real challenge. And if you don't know who that one is, ask God. He'll show you. It'll probably be the first name that pops into your head. But he adores that one. He's madly, passionately, head over heels in love with that one. And he wants his love for that one to move through you. And you can be free to love that one too. And so as we share in a time of communion where we remember God's grace offered to all of us, Will we not only accept his grace for us, but will we pray for those ones? And so as the trays are passed, take the bread, take the juice. You're invited. Jesus doesn't condemn you. He just says, now go leave your life of sin. Have a new start, a fresh beginning. As you hold that bread and juice and wait for everyone to be served, 
Or would you ask God to give you a really tough one? And then look for a way to go out of your way to love that person. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus and this great salvation that is for us. God, we're thankful that you don't condemn us even when we've condemned others. And Father, I pray that you give each of us one really hard one, one really hard person, one that's difficult to love. And set us free to love that person like you do with your love. And we ask for that in Jesus' name. Our hope is in his salvation and his forgiveness. That we are called out of a life of our sin and now we're put in a life of love. So we celebrate right now the greatest victory that it's in Jesus. So let's take this bread and remember the sacrifice he made for us. And this cup is a poured out offering for you and for me that takes away all sin. So now we live in this freedom. Let's drink together to the King. Father, we will never forget how much you love us. And we're so grateful for you're always pursuing us and forgiving us, Lord. We thank you for the sacrifice that Jesus has made. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Another way that we worship here at Manchester Christian is through our giving. And we want to say thank you for your generosity. It's because of what you give each and every week and month that our kids' ministry is able to impact hundreds of children from birth to fifth grade. And where they learn about God's word and praying for one and that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So way to go, church, because of what you give each and every week. We're so thankful. So today, if you've come prepared to give, we have wooden boxes in the back. You can give online or just text the word give to the phone number that's going to be on the screen. But let's pray for these gifts. Father, we're excited that we get to be a part of your kingdom. And that, Father, we're praying for one. We ask boldly, give us one person to share your love with. So may you bless these gifts right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and take your cups and connect cards. Pass them to the aisles. We'll collect those. My name is Jason Rose. I'm the campus pastor here. And if you're a guest with us today, welcome. I would love to meet with you, answer any questions you have, get you connected and volunteering right here today. But if there's anyone in this room right now that wants to make Jesus your Lord and Savior, please don't hesitate. Come talk to me today. But we're so glad you're here. I have two announcements. The first is this coming Sunday at 11 o'clock is what we have called Next. So it's a great opportunity to meet some of the staff, get connected. And we want you to partner with us in volunteering. So come join me this Sunday at 11 o'clock. And as you see what I dropped, we're excited about Easter. We are pumped. So on your way out, man, grab one of these yard signs. You can give any donation you want, but grab some. Put them in your yard. We want people to come to know who Jesus is. So this Easter, we're excited. And on your way out also, These invites, we want you to pass them to your ones, your friends, your neighbors. Grab them on your way out. But right now, let's go and stand up as we continue our time of worship.